Oh, there, yes, I did. It's um, Second uh, Chronicles 34. It's the story of Josiah. And Josiah is a pretty unique king because he's king at eight years old. I just uh, I thought about how to start this story and, and think about it. But you, the best way I can describe it is when we've seen people, young people that have been extremely spoiled and they are demanding things from their parents always and their parents give them almost everything that they can. And the kid turns around and asks for something just completely off the wall. And the parents won't give it to them. The parents finally draw the line at something. And the kid goes into a, a complete rage and fit and turns around and says to mom and dad, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Now, why do you think the kid did that? He's trying to hurt. He's trying to hurt. What, how, what else would it do? It's a hurt type of thing. I didn't get what I want. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to make you hurt. And when we look at how God deals with us, and in the story of Josiah, it's God's people, Jerusalem, picked to be a special people, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And they go through a series of kings in our story, Manasseh being one of them, grandfather to Josiah. Manasseh is evil, wicked. He starts bringing in things into the church little by little until the church is filled with idols. It is filled with, uh, at one section, it's got horses and chariots uh, dedicated to the sun god. It's got all sorts of stuff is going on around the temple. And it's like, how in the world could you hurt God? Let's do it. That's what actually comes into play. <clears throat> It's so bad that one of their gods, they dedicate their children to this god by walking them through the fire. If your kid makes it through the fire, well, good on him. He, he's, he's good to live. Yeah, it's, it's a, gone so far as how can we make God sad, mad, and stir him up. Everything that they could possibly do, it seems like these kings and the people are involved in. And we know it from looking at the Ten Commandments that God has said, listen, no other gods before me. Come on. If you, in visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the second and third generation of those who hate me. You, you look at this and you say, wow, these people are supposed to be people of God. They're representatives of God, and they are doing everything possible to make God mad at them. And in the middle of this, so you've got um, Manasseh that I just talked about. Well, you've also got his son, Amos, comes Amon, Amon, A-M-O-N, Amon, comes around about this time, and he does wickedly like his father. At least Manasseh, Manasseh got taken away captive. He got some prison time. In prison, like with a lot of people, he decided to turn to God. He had time on his hand. And he found out he's at the bottom of the list and he's about ready to die. He's turning to God. And Manasseh does turn to God towards the end of his life. But he, 
he passes on and he leaves the kingdom to his son. His son reigns for two years and his servants kill him right there in the palace. So the people decide that his son, you imagine he only was like 22 when he became king or what, 22 when he died, something like that. Um, he's a young guy. So his son's only eight years old. So let me get, get caught up here and catch up with the story in my Bible. I'm going to read the, um, be referring to the king's portion of it in the Bible if you're wanting to follow along. And I'm thinking I'm going the wrong direction. There we are. Sorry about that. Second Kings 22. And we find this young king making decisions right off the bat. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years, so he's only 39 when he's done, um, in Jerusalem. It goes on and mentions his mother's name and whose daughter she is. And he, in verse 2, the important part, he says, it's said about him, he does right in the sight of the Lord, walking in all of his all the ways of his father David. Now we skip all the other fathers between David and him, but he says you're going to follow in the steps of David. He doesn't follow in the steps of any of his um, real fathers lately. He did not turn to aside to the right or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, that the king sent Sephon, his scribe, and it mentions who his dad and all that is, uh, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hil Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the um, doorkeepers have gathered from the people. So there's a little activity still going on at the temple. We're seeing that, but I think you're going to see later it's not all good. Let them deliver it into the hands of those doing work who are overseers of the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damage of the house to the carpenters and the builders and the masoners to buy timbers and to hum Rock, uh, stones and to repair the house. However, there needs not to be a count because um, these guys actually are good people. They're very faithful. They're trustworthy. It's pretty interesting to note that the, um, how that goes that they, they do trust these type of people in the middle of all this. But it is a shame to hear that the house of the Lord is just in such disrepair. However, they uh, let's see, um, down to verse 8. Then Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Sephon, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Stephen, um, and he read it. Stephen, the scribe, went to the king bringing the word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house in, in the house, and have delivered it to the hands of those who are doing the work overseeing the house of the Lord. And Sephon the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Stephen read it to the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law. So now you get an idea what book they found. Now you're, <laughs> you think about it. How would, how would you feel or how would you think about, um, hey, I found a Bible in the church. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you think this was the basis 
of the church. This should be read like all the time. It should be first and foremost. But they just found it. <laughs> oh. And they read it to the king. Let's see. In verse 10. Then Stephen the scribe showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me the book. And Stephen read it before the king. Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and the son of uh, the scribes, Sephon, and a couple of his top men that are really close to the king. I'll, I'll just go with that instead of trying to pronounce all their words. And he sends them to a prophetess. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of God that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. I want you to put a piece of paper or whatever in, in there. And I want us to go to Deuteronomy 32. We're going to take a look a little bit at this book that they found because it has been saved for us in the scriptures so that we may read it also. So Deuteronomy's 32. Um, well, I'm going to take it to 31 and we'll start out with verse 14. And we'll touch bases on some of the others in it. It said, then the Lord said to Moses, and this is uh, chapter Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call, and now this is where I'm going to get in my tongue twisted. This is uh, uh, Joshua. And present yourself to the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves to the tabernacle of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle and the pillar of the cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with gods of the foreign land, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made to them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them, in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face, that in that day, because of the evils which they have done, and that they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write down this song for yourself and teach it to your children. Put it in their mouth and this song may be a witness of me against the children of Israel. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey of which I swore to their fathers they have, um, they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat and they will turn to other gods and serve them. And they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be that many evils and troubles will come upon them. And this song will testify against them and against uh, their descendants. Now, he goes on down and he outlines everything that God has done for them. You know, God has given this people beautiful gifts. He's made promises and fulfilled them, taken them to the land flowing milk and honey. They have everything laid out before them. They have given them an inheritance, a big inheritance. I mean, you imagine it, it's like, hey, over here is a bunch of vineyards. They're yours, by the way. That's your inheritance. 
And um, over here is a bunch of fruit trees. Yeah, yeah, that's to that family. That's your inheritance. You know, the, God gave them everything, and they turned their backs. And this is where we find Israel in Josiah's time that we were started off reading. You know, by this time in history, the other ten, the other ten tribes of Israel have pretty much faded into the landscape. They have all moved in with um, pagan wives and and fathers and husbands. Uh, they are worshiping their gods. They are part of the country. They aren't even a part of their own people anymore. The only ones that really remained is like Benjamin and Judah. They're the only ones that stay in anywhere faithful. There is, by the way, you notice there was a, priest, a, priest, uh, a priestess that we were just coming up that uh, the king sent people to. There's people that still follow God faithfully. And they're asking God, how long? Hezekiah is one of them. If you get into, uh, or Habakkuk, excuse me, Habakkuk is one of them. You get into reading Habakkuk, it's about this time he's asking God, Lord, what are you going to do? How long are we going to be like this? Are you going to put an end to this? And of course, the Lord answers him. You want to know the end of the history? It actually goes into what we know as Babylon takes over. Yeah, that's where we're going to end in this history of this story of the day. But until then, we're going to go see the, um, the prophetess. All right. We were back in 2 Kings 22 and uh, 13. And the king's sending this group of men, his most faithful men, He's sending them to go see this prophetess. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of God that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that was written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, um, Stephan, the um, scribe and the other men, they go to this prophetess. And she dwells in Jerusalem in the Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke with her. And then she said to them, Thus saith the Lord of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me. Now it's, I think it's beautiful that God is working through his people. And it doesn't matter the race. It doesn't matter um, whether you're male or female. If God calls you to be to do a work, he's got to work for you. And people recognize it. And of course, the king has sent, these, sent his best men to her. Then she said to them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you... To, to me, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring calamities on this place and on the inhabitants, on the, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have burnt incense to other gods, and they might provoke me to anger in all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place, and it shall not be quenched. But for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this matter, you shall speak to him. Thus saith the Lord God, concerning the words which you have heard. Because of your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what was spoken against this place and against the inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I have heard you saith the Lord. Now I want you to take note that in the worst of conditions, when everything and everybody around you has turned from God, and you turn towards God, He's listening. 
He's there to reach out. You do not turn to God in humility and come before Him with tears that God is not listening. Be assured that He does love His people. Mm. But for the king of Judah who sent you to require me in this mass and, uh, manner, you speak to him as 18. Thus says the Lord of Israel concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before a God when you heard that what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants. And they would become a desolation and a curse. And you tore your clothes and wept before me. I have heard you, saith the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to the grave in peace. And your eyes shall not see the calamity which will bring upon this place. So they brought back the word to the king. Well, it's kind of a tough one. You're going to die. But then again, we all are, right? But this king has been promised, you're going to go to the grave in peace. Then the king's, in verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 1. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. And then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of his heart and with all of his soul and to perform all the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. And the king, king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priest of the second order and the doorkeepers to bring out the uh, bring out of the temple the of the Lord all the articles that were made to Baal to you know to there's going to be a bunch of different names Asherah and for all the host of heaven he burnt them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kindred and carried the ashes to Bethel. He removed all the idolatrous priests from the uh, whom the king of Judah had uh, ordained to burn the incenses on the high places. Now that is where the kings before him in the cities of Judah in the places all around Jerusalem. And those who burned the incense to Baal and to the sun and to the moon and constellations to all the host of the heavens. And he brought out the wooden images from the house of the Lord to the brook of Kindred outside of Jerusalem and burned it at the brook Kindred. It's Kimron, I think. Um, in the, and ground it to ashes and threw the ashes on the graves of the common people. And he tore down the ritual booths and the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the wooden images. And he brought out all the priests from the cities of Judah and defiled the high, priest, uh, high places where the priests had burned incense. And um, but, uh, from Geba to Beersheba, he broke down all the high places at the gates we're at the entrance of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were in left to the city, left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priest of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren, and he defiled Tef, Tefla uh, anyway, which is in the valley of the sun. Himeron or something like that, um, that no man might make his sons and daughters pass through the fire of Moloch. Then he removed the horses that the king of Judah had dedicated to the son at the entrance of the house of the Lord, 
by the chambers of Nathan and Milkit, the officials, who was in the court, and he burnt the chariots of the sun with fire. The altars that were on the roof of the chambers of, oh my goodness, he, see, you get the idea that he just continually goes through the whole entire countryside, and he defiles, burns, thrashes. He takes, takes the priest and the people's bones that have um, given themselves over to these idols. He takes them and burns them on top of all their altars. Uh, the only ones he doesn't touch is the priest of God or the prophets of God. Any of their graves, do not touch. Don't go near them. And now, and we're going to go down to verse 23 of chapter 23 of Second Kings. But in the 18th year of the king of Josiah was Passover, was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted with mediums and spirits and household of God, idols and abominations. Now, we can go down and, and read all this. You're going to find out that... Uh, um, the king went and put on such a Passover feast and celebration that hadn't been seen for a long, long time. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, I'll tell you, this is where things are going to get a little tough. And I'm going to say it pretty plain. But we, as Christians, we get into Easter, a lot of our religions do, and as a celebration of the death of Christ. And then we go home and our house is decorated with a rabbits that represent the God of fertility. You throw a bunch of eggs all over around the yard for your kids to play with. It, how much different is it? You just come from the house of God and you come home and you put things like this. Or you go out to church and rarely does many people pick up their Bible anymore and really look at it. But you encourage your kids to get the latest, greatest um, wizard book of, of Harry Potter or watch the latest, greatest kids movie. And I don't know if anybody's looked at Walt Disney's kids' movies or any of the Marvels or any of the other ones that are out there, but they're all the time going to Greek gods, foreign gods, wizardry, um, spirits, ghosts. Everything seems to be out there that attracts people's attentions, but very little time do we ever spend in the Word of God. It's not the thing. And how much more do you think the United States is going to just keep sliding under the protection of God when we go and blaspheme God in every aspect we can. Just uh, listen to a report this week um, on the border. You know, they, they stopped the wall from being up, and, and that can be pretty controversial, publicized and politicized, and I'm not going to get into that much. But the report was talking about what goes on down there where the wall is not. The people that have been hired, they call coyotes, that take people across the border, supposedly illegally. Well, these people aren't good people. They're thieves and robbers and, and murderers. If they don't like you and you're in the back mouth in, in, the book, uh, in, the, in the boat crossing the river, they just push you over. You either swim or drown. When they take them out in, into the desert, if you're old and feeble and you start complaining and, you, and you've paid all the money and you don't have any money left, 
they just leave you. You just fade away and die. If you're a good-looking young man, woman, child, they will traffic you, rape you, kill you, whatever they want to. That is what we consider our ways of taking care of people. And this is the kind of thing we're letting go. You know, traffic, human trafficking, I didn't ever think was a real thing. We used to study this in school, the slavery, and thought how horrible that was and how much we thought that we had grown since then and got past all that stuff. And now we do it it's growing to be a big, big business all over the place. If you're a street kid, guess what? Social media will take you in. You can go by the latest, greatest rapper's house, and they'll let you in. They'll train the street kids to entertain the adults at the parties. And we call this um, progress. You know... We look at the society that we live in and you know that judgment is going to be coming because God is a just and righteous God. He loves to the utmost. He has given everything that you have a, could have a life of freedom and free of all this stuff. And we as a spoiled rotten kid have said, we hate you, we hate you, we hate you. We're going to do everything we can to make you mad and sad. I encourage us all to take a look at God, pick up the Bible, read of that loving God who really has your best interest in mind, who has the best interest of your, your family. But yeah, there's going to be judgment coming upon this earth. And has already started. And we should not be surprised.